Good afternoon and welcome to Invest Precision Medicine. I'm Stephanie Baum, Director of Special Projects. Thank you for joining us for the State of Precision Medicine panel discussion. I view this panel as the glue that binds our sessions together. It certainly is the broadest in scope. And so there's a freedom on this panel to explore issues in precision medicine beyond the more specific panel topics we've heard over this past few days. This would be a great opportunity to ask questions provoked by the conversations this week. Precision medicine has been gaining ground as more and more providers provide prescribe genetic tests and more payers decide to cover targeted therapies. In this panel, experts in the field will provide a broad overview of where we are and where we need to go to make the promise and potential of precision medicine part of mainstream medicine. So it's with some anticipation that I introduce our panel for this session. Moderating this panel is Jonathan Hirsch, founder of SIAPS. During a decade of building the company, Jonathan defined and implemented a vision for transforming cancer care through precision medicine and real world evidence. Jonathan serves as the advisory on the advisory board of Freenome and has helped shape the regulatory use of real world evidence through creating and serving as principal investigator for a research collaboration with the FDA. Jonathan has catalyzed national cancer data sharing networks, including serving on the White House Cancer Moonshot Data Sharing work group, Working Group. As both an active angel investor and partner in venture funds, including the Kleiner Perkins Seed Fund, Jonathan has incubated and invested in dozens of companies at the intersection of healthcare and technology. Welcome to the panel, Jonathan. Also on the panel, we have Dr. Daniel Necht, Vice President, Transformation Clinical Product at CVS Health. He is responsible for clinical product ideation, concept development and testing, optimization, launch, performance and measurement in collaboration with key stakeholders across the enterprise. Prior to CVS Health, he served, or prior to this current role at CVS Health, rather, he served as Vice President of Health Strategy and Innovation in Medical Affairs. He joined Aetna in 2016 and has led a series of enterprise-wide strategic initiatives, including the company's efforts to combat mis opioid misuse and addiction. Following CVS Health's acquisition of Aetna, his team re remained focused on leveraging data analytics to provide actionable insights for patients and providers that increase value of care. Welcome to the panel, Daniel. Also on the panel, we have David Spetzler, President and Chief Scientific Officer with Keras Life Sciences. David joined Keras in 2009. He leads the company's clinical testing service and development of proprietary technologies to aid in the creation of precision medicine technologies for individual cancer patients, as well as non-invasive technologies to identify and predict cancer at the early stages. Prior to his position at Keras, David was a member of the research faculty at Arizona State University, where he developed multiplex nanotechnologies for single molecule detection of nucleic acid and protein targets. David is an adjunct faculty member of the Molecular Cellular Biology Program at Arizona State University. Welcome to the panel, David. And we also have on the panel, Dr. Nephi Walton, Associate Medical Director of Precision Genomics at Intermountain Healthcare. He also serves as the Associate Medical Director of Intermountain's Genome Sequencing Laboratory. He is Chair of Genomics and Translational Bioinformatics for the American Medical Informatics Association, and has presented extensively on integrating genomic information into the medical record and translating the use of genomics into general medical practice. Prior to joining Intermountain, Dr. Walton led several research initiatives in genomics and informatics at Geisinger. He successfully completed a pilot integration of genomic data into the EPIC electronic health record system for both pharmacogenomics and CDC tier one genetic conditions. Welcome to the panel, Nephi. And with that, I'll hand it over to you, Jonathan. Thank you so much, Stephanie. And I'll uh, ask the, uh, the panelists to also uh, turn on their videos uh, as well. Um, so thank you so much for organizing this and, and for having all of us here today. Um, I am really excited uh, to be moderating this panel with uh, three leaders in precision medicine uh, covering three different aspects of the industry. Uh, one on the molecular laboratory and molecular information side. Uh, a second on the healthcare delivery and healthcare system side, 
and a third on the integrated uh, payer uh, and pharmacy uh, side of the equation. And I'm really uh, grateful to the panelists for joining us today. So over the past decade, precision medicine has gone from an idea uh, in the minds of, of many of us who have been in this industry for a while to a practical reality of daily cancer treatment and the treatment of certain other diseases. Precision medicine has impacted the way we think about how we diagnose disease, how we operationalize treatment of disease, and how we develop new therapeutics and diagnostics. And it has been a fantastic evolution to see over the past decade. Uh, I wanna start off by asking the panelists what they see as the current state of precision medicine and how each of their organizations plays a role in that current state. So David, uh, if we could, I'd like to start with you. Sure, so what I see happening in precision medicine right now is the evolution from single biomarker based associations to more complex patterns that are identified through machine learning and artificial intelligence. Uh, the ability to test more broadly has never been more available. Uh, and that gives us the ability to start to find and identify patterns within the molecular system that are predictive of various therapeutic responses. And uh, that's seen most uh, dramatically in oncology and cancer uh, but really the fundamental technology to decipher the biology is applicable across all disease states. And so we're now at a point where the, the sequencing technology and the computational technology exists uh, to really start to deconvolute uh, what are you know, complex systems. And so uh, the intersection of, of mathematics and molecular biology uh, is, is available and happening right now. Uh, so we're, we're at the very beginning of the process of uh, being able to fully utilize precision medicine. Uh, and, and that makes it a very exciting time uh, for patients and providers alike. Great, great. Uh, Nephi, if I could ask you to, to go next. Yeah, and I'd like to start out with a little bit of history. So, you know, historically, genomics has been delivered by clinical geneticists. And this is a field that has a very limited number of people in it. And they've really been the only ones who really understand how to deliver and use genomic data. Um, I don't think that we're ever going to scale the number of geneticists fast enough to, um, to handle all the information and the new information that's coming from genomics. And so what I'm trying to do at Intermountain is we're trying to find ways to more innovative models and ways to deliver genetic information to, uh, to patients and providers um, without clinical geneticists. In a sense, I'm trying to put myself out of a job and people in my field out of a job, not because um, I want to, I feel like we have to find ways to enable um, frontline providers to use genomics. And there's a lot of things involved in that. It's, you know, changing uh, our care models, changing our testing methodologies, changing, um, using informatics to um, integrate genomic data into electronic health record in a way that guides providers in how to use it. Um, so right now, if you look at clinical genomics, um, most of the clinics that I'm familiar with are scheduling a year out or more. And some are even stop, are not even seeing adult patients anymore because they simply can't handle the volume. I don't see that the, the number of clinical geneticists growing. And so how do we make frontline providers comfortable with this information and how do we act, um, help them know what test to send? So historically clinical geneticists have um, looked at a patient and said, oh, I think they have this, we'll test this gene. I think that model is extremely outdated. I think that we need to start looking at just whole genome sequencing everybody and that's the standard of care for genetic testing. And then using informatics and, and different, um, different models of care to deliver that um, information back to the patient and the provider in the appropriate way. And so those are some of the things that I'm working for, towards is really using, um, you know, informatics, leveraging that to deliver information for precision care so that, so that your pediatrician or your family practice doc can take that information and inform uh, your care with it. Great. Thank you so much. And Dan? Hi. Uh, well, first of all, thanks for uh, the opportunity to speak with uh, such 
uh, prestigious uh, speakers as it relates to the state of precision medicine. Really excited for the conversation. Um, I think uh, from, from my perspective, uh, I think we're in very early innings as, uh, as it relates to precision medicine. And, and if you just think back 20 years ago, um, when the first human uh, genome was decoded um, and the progress the scientific and clinical community has made, is just absolutely incredible. I think what we're really excited about is to see sort of the clinical validity catch up to all the great scientific and technological advancements. So if you think about the cost of decoding a human genome now, which is almost around less than $1,000 in certain circumstances versus 20 years ago, just incredibly um, uh, impressive uh, reduction in costs. Now, now we're just waiting to see you know, how, making, seeing the, 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 the clinical and the medical impact catch up with, with the scientific um, state. So for example, we're seeing more and more therapeutics uh, hit the market where there is a, a diagnostic biomarker, but you know, we're, we're seeing that in oncology and a few other clinical specialties. Ex- um, looking forward to seeing that expand further uh, going into primary care and other uh, clinical conditions as well. So early innings, um, and I think we're at an inflection point. Great, great. You know, one of the topics just uh, playing off of uh, something that that Dan, you just uh, alluded to is, is the topic of clinical utility and how that is judged by different institutions and the role that each of your organizations play in understanding clinical utility and then translating that into practical clinical care. And uh, everyone has an important role to play in that equation. And I'm wondering if, if each of you could touch a little bit on how you actually go about assessing clinical utility, how that translates into how you're going to bring that into patient care, and how you really think about working with uh, the industry and working with other parties uh, on that effort. So, I mean, maybe Dan, just starting, just starting with you on that, given uh, your, your significant role on the payer side. Sure. Uh, yeah, so uh, our perspective at Caremark is to ensure that our um, patients and members get the right access to evidence-based care in the right location. So uh, when we uh, take a look at uh, new therapies um, that may have an associated biomarker, we, we want to make sure that the biomarker um, is uh, driving better uh, outcomes, more appropriate utilization of the of the the therapeutic. So, you know, we have sub subspecialists reviewing uh, new therapies and ensuring that any sort of uh, prior authorization as it relates to biomarker is is appropriate and drives better better care. Um, so that that's at a high level. I'll just I'll stop. Love to hear what the other folks think. Nephi or David, do you want to? Uh, do either of you want to jump in? I, I can jump in if you'd like. Um, sure. So um, from. I've been working really closely with a pair on whole genome sequencing. I'm also involved um, in some clin- some testing guidelines that are being put out. And one of the frustrating things is as we look at testing guidelines, we say, you know what, whole genome is so cheap now, and it, there's so much more power in that this should really be a standard of care. But then we look at what payers are paying for and, and what is really being used in clinical practice. It just hasn't translated there yet. So we can't really give that recommendation, even though, you know, there's pretty clear evidence that that's where we should go, especially when the price gets so low. I mean, even gene panels are being run on exome backbones and now genome is getting so close to the price of exome, it, it really makes sense to do whole genome sequencing. And so there's, you know, when you, from my perspective, when you look at payers, they want recommendations from, uh, you know, big organizations to say, you know, this should be first line testing, et cetera, but um, they don't necessarily look at all the, the uh, published, uh, <laughs> studies out there that show, you know, the benefits, um, especially as the cost comes down of some of these um, testing modalities. So um, I think that there's really good evidence t- from the germline testing perspective to go to whole genome sequencing, I th- and especially as the price comes down, I think that's where we're going to go. And unfortunately, I, I think just because of the way things work um, and the, how fast medicine moves, it might be a little bit of time before that will be, you know, successfully adopted everywhere. I think at Intermountain, because, you know, we're an integrated system and working closely with our payer, we're hopefully going to be able to move that 
uh, needle a little bit faster. And I know that there's a, a couple of other organizations that are that are working towards that as well. Um, one thing I did want to, to point out on this, you know, there's a lot of low hanging fruit where there is good clinical utility that really hasn't fully been operationalized to start with. So there's a lot of work to be done just to begin with. But when you look at things like pharmacogenomics, we're, we're getting a lot of information there, but, and there's good evidence that shows that we can change practice with clinical decision support around pharmacogenomics and make people prescribe differently. What is missing is really does changing these prescribing practices actually change patient outcome. And so I feel like that's an area where a lot more work needs to be done. We have a lot of information. There's a lot that we can do, but it would be good to start doing some studies um, so that we can start getting payers to adopt more of these technologies. So one of the things that uh, I think Nephi just touched on is you know, the nature of studies to generate clinical utility. Uh, and traditionally it's been about, you know, formal phase three trials that can show the predictive utility of a particular biomarker associated with a particular therapy, um, at least in the case of oncology. Uh, and, and one of the things that uh, I think needs to change is the nature of those trials. And so uh, with the ability to test broadly uh, across a, a much larger patient population, uh, the utilization of real world evidence is going to become essential uh, for the medicine to keep up with the science. And so, um, you know, running studies with very hard endpoints like progression free survival and overall survival um, are the current gold standard, but that doesn't necessarily mean that we need to leave it that way. So, the introduction of alternative endpoints. Uh, that can be more easily captured in, for example, EMR systems, I think is going to become essential to deal with, you know, in, in mathematics, what we call the hypersegmentation problem. And so, you know, one of the problems that exists within genomics is the fact that, you know, when you start measuring deeply and broadly, you find that, in fact, instead of dealing with one patient population, you're dealing with 100 patient populations. And then, you know, getting to the sufficient numbers of patients within each subset becomes virtually impossible. And so we can't actually design proper studies to be able to use the traditional model. And so finding alternative ways to you know, convince ourselves uh, that in fact, the science is real and the medicine is real uh, it is essential uh, because the, the current methodology was designed for population-based studies. Uh, and what we're really talking about is personalized medicine where in fact, each patient is individual uh, and being able to, to drive towards you know, care standards that are improving outcomes uh, is going to require an evolution of the current trial model uh, and utilization of this information in uh, a more intelligent way. Yeah, you know, each each of your organizations um, is, is actually, uh, seems to me from the outside to be embarking on, on interesting programs that intersect large scale molecular testing with real world data sourced from uh, EMR and other places. So obviously, you know, David, you just, you talked about a little bit about what you're doing. Nephi Intermountain has, you know, a large scale program and Dan, you know, certainly uh, with the relationship with Tempest, uh, there's that component. So how, how, do you, how do you all think about how real world evidence is playing into the evolution of how you implement precision medicine. Um, and David, if uh, David, if you want to start, or or anyone else wants to jump in, sure, I'll I'll, I'll start. Spend a lot of time on this. So you know, the first thing, just from a practical scenario, is identifying you know what are the features of real world evidence that we can use to assess clinical utility. And um, you know, when we're talking about on oncology. Uh, which is where I do all my work. Um, it's, it really comes down to time to next treatment, time on treatment. So those are uh, data elements that are robustly captured within EMR systems. Um, and they actually correlate really, really well to progression-free survival. And so it's kind of a cause and effect situation. The cause is a progression event. The effect is a change in therapy. Uh, and so you can utilize endpoints like that to determine which patient populations are going to benefit more or less from particular therapeutic interventions um, and use those patient populations to define biomarker patterns uh, that are predictive. And so, uh, you know, we always have to be careful when you're doing a retrospective analysis across a large number of biomarkers because the false discovery rate is very significant. 
but we're also seeing an accumulation of data at such a rate that you can create those retrospective hypotheses and then prospectively test them uh, quite easily without having to go through kind of a, a formal prospective clinical trial. And so uh, that becomes really important where you, know, you establish a pattern, you establish a hypothesis, and then you access you know, alternative existing data sets to be able to prove it. Um, and so, you know, we're, we're entering a phase, I think, where, you know, diagnostics and precision medicine is going to move from something that is kind of an afterthought to something that is going to be required up front. Uh, the cost to the patient, the cost to the healthcare system of giving a treatment that is ineffective uh, is really substantial. And so um, as we begin to have confidence in these associations and predictions, you know, we're going to see a reversal there where you know, the payer shouldn't actually be paying for drugs until they know that they're going to work. Um, it's in the best interest of patients to avoid ineffective treatments. Uh, and, and that's something that uh, I think we're, we're coming uh, to kind of a, a culmination point, a tipping point where that's going to be required. And, um, you know, it, it's kind of sad, really, though, as we look back on things, uh, the number of patients that aren't getting even minimal biomarker testing uh, especially in oncology. I mean, you look at the number of non-small cell lung cancer patients that don't get EGFR testing, you know, even though it's been standard of care for almost 20 years, it, it's, it's kind of sad. And so um, the, the role of diagnostics has always been kind of, you know, underappreciated, uh, but there seems to be a shift there now. And, and actually, I think COVID played a very large role in that. You, know, you can't solve a problem you don't know about. Uh, and diagnostics is really the identification of that problem. So I think we're in a really interesting position to be able to use all the information at our disposal to make significant headways uh, in this field. Dan, did you want to jump in on that? I did, yeah. That was a terrific tee up uh, about our program, Transform Oncology, which really uh, aims and aspires to empower community oncologists to, to practice evidence-based uh, uh, cancer care. So our Transform Oncology program is essentially uh, we at CVS Health Caremark partner with uh, community oncologists, provide them software called Novologix. And uh, this program essentially streamlines the prior authorization process, which aligns with NCCN guidelines. So it's upfront molecular diagnostics for cancer care um, uh, based on guidelines. And the idea there is to promote the use of biomarkers and precision medicine in, in cancer care. And so uh, we rolled this program out and I think it really hits that to the quadruple aim we're aspiring to making the, uh, making sure uh, cancer care is evidence-based, personalized through precision medicine. It simplifies the provider um, experience and ultimately reduces unnecessary spend. So uh, we've, this program has been live for a few years now and we're starting to see uh, really good outcomes. And in, in fact, we uh, published a uh, an abstract of ASCO um, that showed that when providers adhere to this uh, program, um, we could reduce total cost of care by 27%. And so essentially providing more pre you know, precision uh, medicine driven cancer care, reducing uh, unnecessary spend and, and better individualized cancer care. That's, that's fantastic. I didn't see that ASCO abstract. So that's great to, great to hear about. Uh, Nephi? Yes. Yeah, so, um, you know, I was fortunate to work at Geisinger where they spearheaded a lot of this stuff um, in the germline genomic space. And so there's, they've gen essentially generated a lot of the evidence that we're jumping off from at Intermountain. And um, I mean, what you find is when you're leading the way, there's not a lot of evidence out there. And so looking at ways to generate it quickly um, with pilots and just do things that make sense. I mean, we're, we're, we're launching a, a program, hopefully um, soon to, to, to do some uh, testing in underserved communities. And we're looking at, you know, we did, when we detect a BRCA1 carrier, there's a potential $450,000 savings to the healthcare system for just that one patient. And so you can see that, you know, it doesn't take a lot of patients to pick up to really recoup your investment. Um, one of the biggest challenges is that, you know, pay, um, those patients don't typically stay with the same insurance for a long time. And so they don't necessarily look at all those long-term benefits, but in some of the integrated healthcare systems where they have like Geisinger and Intermountain, where it's a more stable patient population, there's a real advantage there to being able to detect and stop things early. Um, so, I mean, 
what we have to do, we, I have um, a guy here before I left, I was working on pharmacogenomics and part of the problem there was, you know, what, how can we, you know, the studies aren't there to show the impact. And that's where we started looking at retrospective data. And I actually didn't get to finish that before I went, moved to Intermountain, but, but you can look, you know, once you have this big sequence population, you can actually go back and look and say, you know, if we had intervened here and known, what could we have changed in the, in the pathway they took? So there's some of that retrospective information you can use, but really, um, you know, when you're leading in an area, you, you sort of have to go at it and generate your own evidence and just take a risk. Some of the stuff seems like common sense, but um, it doesn't always work out the way, the way you think. I think there's significant savings um, in whole genome sequencing from a quality perspective. When you look at absolute cost reduction, it's still good, but it's not near as significant. So I, the other thing we have to really take into account that I feel like gets missed a little bit on the payer side, not to be too critical, because I know they're a business and they have to make money, is that they, there's not enough um, uh, stock put into you know, the patient's actual um, uh, life and, and um, being able to continue their life, actually. There's some genetic conditions, if you detect them early, you know, you're actually financially worse off because um, they live longer with the chronic condition. So, but overall, I think there is a cost savings and there's definitely a huge benefit to the patient. And so um, we just have to lead the way and start generating our own evidence. Yeah. And there's, um, uh, I'm glad you touched on, on the, the nature of the integrated health system and the ability for that health system uh, to, to potentially have an advantage in kind of getting over that cold start problem in evidence generation. There's, there's a question in the chat related to that around whether an integrated health system has an advantage here. And maybe I'll kind of expand that a little bit more broadly to say uh, as a question for, for each of you, um, what are, what are the conditions that you need and specifically what are the partnerships and relationships that you need in place and, and that you've either created or the things that you're looking to create to get over these uh, problems around cold start evidence generation, uh, around the ability to engage with different parties whose incentives may not be exactly aligned with yours. How, how do you think about putting in place those relationships um, or uh, if, you, if you have those relationships in place already, could you talk about some examples of, of where things are working well? Do you want me to start with that? Um, sure. Okay. Um, so, I mean, I think we have the advantage at Intermountain that we, you know, we're an integrated system and we also have our own sequencing laboratory. And so we sort of have the whole chain. Um, there are opportunities, I think, out there to partner with sequencing laboratories. I know that there's a number of um, companies in that space that are looking to partner with integrated healthcare systems to do sort of the same thing. Um, I think everybody sees sort of the vision of where things need to go. And the challenge is working out all the details of how it works through that system. And I think, you know, the thing you have to do is bring everybody to the table and show them the benefits in their space, even though we're an integrated system I, you essentially still have to talk to the payer part of the system and they are a different entity that has their own, you know, financials and uh, their own um, goals that they have to get to. And so there's, there's real benefit, there's real financial benefit to, um, to use precision medicine. And you just have to take what information is there, work together as a team. And if you have to do it, even in a small pilot process, um, bring that together. The other thing is there, you know, um, as far as, partnerships, there are, you know, vendors and companies out there that specialize in certain things that do them well. I think if you're a system starting and you try to take on everything by yourself without using, uh, it's not going to be cost effect effective and you're not going to be able to deliver it the way that you want. So partnerships are also important um, to help uh, deliver this care. Um, it's hard to find, you know, for some things it's hard to find when you're doing new things. There aren't always companies out there that will, they'll help you, but there are there are some, uh, a number of startups that are coming up that um, are, are trying to address this problem in this space. And, and I think there are opportunities for partnership out there. David or Dan, do you wanna, do you wanna jump in? Sure, I'll make a couple comments. So one of, the, one of the things that we can see happening right now is that the nature of precision medicine is, is changing for, 
a long time, it appeared that it was, you know, moving towards kind of commoditization where, you know, the sequencing technology is getting cheaper and the costs are being reduced. Um, and, you know, so a lot of different institutions started to build sequencing labs. Um, that I think uh, has been a failed experiment for a couple of reasons. One is that, you know, the cost of sequencing only goes down if you're at high volume. Uh, so you have to keep those machines running 24 seven in order to actually achieve the economies of scale that actually make the sequencing affordable uh, for larger populations. Uh, but the second component to it is uh, what we start to see happening now where you can take these patterns that are identified through machine learning um, and make better associations and make better predictions on patients response. Uh, and those signatures are, are no longer commoditized. Those are proprietary signatures. Uh, and so instead of you know, things driving towards kind of the commoditization uh, in a distributed network, I think what we're seeing is a reversal of that where uh, it's gonna be centralized labs that are able to do sequencing at massive scale uh, with uh, proprietary informatics to maximize patient benefit. Uh, and so that starts to change the economics of uh, the whole precision medicine landscape. Uh, and it also makes it very difficult for, uh, for the payers to keep up. Um, and so I think um, a few years ago with the introduction of panel codes, it, it appeared to be this you know, terrible, terrible thing. Uh, but in hindsight, I think that the panel codes uh, are in fact, you know, kind of genius uh, in many ways, because what it does is it says, okay, here is kind of a, a baseline price that we'll pay for sequencing and uh, compensate it for. And then it becomes up to the providers uh, and uh, the, the treating physicians to determine what is most appropriate for that patient. Uh, and that really allows for the advancement of the science and the medicine uh, in an unencumbered uh, method uh, and, and way where you know, we can take advantage of the the ability to kind of generate new signatures and find new patterns very quickly. Um, and it doesn't increase the cost. And th that's one of the most important aspects of, of this, that every time we learn about a new association, uh, it shouldn't lead to you know, an increase in the, in the testing cost. It shouldn't increase uh, the underlying um, you know, nature of uh, kind of the cost driver of the testing. It, it can, of course, have downstream implications in the care pathway, uh, but we're at a point now where uh, we can really start to um, simplify things uh, and you know, make this technology available broadly. And uh, I think that that's gonna be really important to making sure that we take advantage of this technological revolution that we're witnessing uh, to maximize patient benefit. That's interesting. So basically it's no longer about the, or it's, it's no longer about the sequencing and the lab isn't about the sequencing, it's about the informatics, the AI on top of that to draw novel associations and integrate that into care. The, yeah, the, the only thing, great, great comments uh, by my colleagues. I think the only thing I would add is for us to really unleash the, the potential of precision medicine, it, it really is gonna take uh, uh, trust and collaboration across the healthcare ecosystem. So you know, just simplistically three legs of a stool, right? You need to have payers having the right clinical policies in place to cover and reimburse for uh, biomarkers that are actionable and improve health, right? Two is you need providers that are ready, willing, and able to uh, um, deploy precision medicine and, and counsel uh, patients around this. Um, and then finally, you know, you need labs that are, are um, uh, high, high quality um, and, and you know, share data to the broader community. If there are, you know, for example, variants of uh, unknown certainty that, that is contributed to the broader um, sort of a scientific body to advance uh, the field of precision medicine. So I, there's, um, uh, oh, go ahead, Nifa. I just want to make one follow-up co comment. So, you know, I agree. And I, um, genetic testing, sequencing right now is a commodity. I mean, it's 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 not a place you want to compete in. The most difficult part is the interpretation. And it is still really difficult, frankly. And, and that's actually where most of your cost is when you send a genetic test. But the thing that um, I think a lot of people are missing is that 
we're rapidly starting to understand what that sequence means. And as our knowledge and, and the information around that sequence grows over time, the, the cost to interpretation comes, becomes much lower. And so if, if we're not careful and we don't start work, working on how to implement these things in our clinical practice, we're gonna to get to a state where we have all of this knowledge and sequencing is so cheap and we have all this explosion of information and we don't have any way to really use it in clinical care. And so I think people need to look towards the future, not saying, well, this is going to continue to be expensive. As, as we increase the knowledge of the genome, I mean, it's, it's, that information is going to be there and then everything's cheap. Do you, do you think there's, and there's a, there's a good question in the chat that I'll also you know, riff off of a little bit, which is, um, you know, do you think that there is consensus and agreement on the, the clinical, operational, and economic endpoints that we need to achieve in order for us to scale the implementation of precision medicine, whether on the, the provider or the payer side. Um, is, is there that agreement? Are we at that state or are we still in the state where we're all kind of figuring out what do we really need to demonstrate in order to start scaling this a little bit more? And, you know, obviously, you know, Dan with, with the uh, prior authorization uh, capability and integration of genetics into that, I mean, that sounds like a fantastic you know, program uh, to kind of build on and build an evidence base off of. So I'm curious your thoughts there for everyone. Yeah, well, um, yeah, I'll start off by saying, I, I think we, we at CS are well under, you know, we are uh, well underway uh, deploying precision medicine. So it's not just a handful of drugs that require uh, you know, biomarker to have a prior authorization approved. We have over, I think it's 140 plus now, ranging from oncology to endocrinology and neurology. So, um, you know, that's a, that's a pretty um, effective way of promoting precision medicine across the, the space. And so, you know, we, we make sure we have a very robust process internally uh, relying on clinical guidelines uh, from subspecialty groups as well as our own uh, specialty match providers to make sure we have the right, um, you know, we apply the right level of evidence and, and clinical rigor and ensuring, you know, the prior authorization is enhancing uh, value of care uh, determined. So that's that's the framework we have in place. And, um, you know, it, it, it's working well um, and we continue to improve on it. I, you know, I think that the payers landscape has changed dramatically too. I mean, at this point, um, at least in oncology for late stage cancer patients, um, insurance is covering 90% of, of patients. Um, and so, you know, it, it's gone are the days where you really had to fight hard. It's, it's, not, um, it's not like it used to be uh, in uh, the oncology arena. Uh, where there has been a recognition uh, of the value of precision medicine and, and broad panel testing. Um, and so it becomes um, easier and easier every day to uh, provide this opportunity and this uh, technology to, to patients. And um, I think the payer community is actually very supportive uh, of uh, this change. And uh, we've seen a real shift there. Uh, so um, yeah, it's more accessible now than ever before. I would say from the germline perspective, it's still fairly challenging. Um, we, we're actually working on some statewide initiatives and, you know, I've worked with Medicaid to get, uh, or at least state Medicaid to get um, things approved like exome sequencing for certain um, pediatric patients. And so I still think that, you know, from my perspective, at least we've, we still have a lot of challenges. I think it's definitely getting better though. Um, things are, are looking up and and people are starting to see the benefits and, and there's real um, evidence out there now. So um, it's, it's getting better, but it's still challenging in my space. Yep. So we've spent a lot of time on, on the panel so far talking about current state, current state challenges, the kind of immediate next steps. I want to shift a little bit and, and talk about, talk about the future, the next five years uh, and, and what, what precision medicine holds over the next, you know, let's just say five year time frame. So as we see novel therapeutic modalities like gene therapy uh, coming into place, uh, as we see the rise of proteomic platforms, there are now I think two, possibly three uh, companies that have gone public or are about to go public uh, that have proteomic uh, measurement technologies. 
um, including Nautilus and, and a few others. Uh, I'm, I'm just wondering if each of you can talk about what do you see over the next five years and what are your organizations doing uh, right now to, to achieve that five-year vision? So I can, I can start. So, um, right, so at, at Keras, we're focused on oncology at this point, um, you know, primarily doing tissue testing. Um, however, the evolution of the technology is now enabling us to do very similar types of tests out of the blood. Uh, and so utilizing whole exome sequencing and whole transcriptome sequencing on cell-free DNA and cell-free RNA uh, is really unlocking a whole new opportunity to be able to influence treatments uh, and improve patient outcome. Uh, and so as you start to deploy that type of um, capability, um, we shift from, okay, we're gonna do one test uh, on the tumor and then, you know, try and guide all downstream therapeutic interventions based upon what becomes an obsolete data point because the tumor is evolving in response to therapeutic intervention uh, to something where we can start to monitor the evolution of that cancer and start to see, you know, when do these therapies start to become ineffective? What is a more appropriate um, change point? So uh, right now we're still limiting ourselves to, you know, fairly kind of gross measurements of progression using scanning technology that we know uh, is not necessarily uh, the best way to identify when progression events are happening. Uh, and in the next five years, we're going to see that technology really come to fruition where you can uh, guide interventions more appropriately. You can find the cancer earlier. I mean, the ultimate goal really should be to eliminate late stage disease by having early detection occur and then remove it surgically, right? The best way to cure a cancer is to find it when it's early enough that you can just cut it out and remove it. Uh, and, and that's gonna happen. That's, that's within that five year time horizon. Uh, so early diagnostics is gonna change the landscape dramatically. Uh, and, and it's gonna become you know, something that is so pervasive uh, that uh, we're able to make huge strides in the quality of life for um, really all human beings. So, um, you know, the, I think that one of the biggest challenges we face in germline genomics now is, you know, what do the changes that we see mean and knowing whether something is truly a variant that's going to cause disease or, or what it does. So adding, you know, the studies where we can see how those genes are translated and, and know, you know, if these functional studies, so we know, um, we know what's going on. We know that whether they're pathogenic and we know that they make the changes in the right tissue to cause the disease that we're looking at. That's really important. And so I think that as these things scale and we start to, to relate them to understand, you know, germline genomics with uh, and their pathway analysis and how things work in the body, that it, it everything kind of grows exponentially in our ability in terms to detect, diagnose and treat disease. And we're seeing some incredible um, uh, genetic therapies that are, that are starting to, to come out. I mean, I remember in training, you know, which was not that long ago, you know, I saw a child with spinal muscular atrophy and, you know, the message that we had to give the parents was that child is going to pass away and there's nothing we can do. Where in practice, you know, um, a couple of years ago, maybe it's about a year and a half ago, um, we had, we, we now have a therapy and those children live and, and it's just remarkable. And I think as we start to discover the genetic basis of, of all diseases, that we can make targeted therapies that will, will have dramatic effects. And there will even be some curative things where you don't have to stay on long-term medication. So I think that that, that is a, an area that's starting to, uh, to grow and it sh shows a lot of potential. We're already seeing some great benefits, but um, it started sort of in rare disorders. And you know, I think in the, in the not too distant future, we'll be treating more common disorders. Yeah, it's good. It, uh, I think the next few years will be really exciting um, uh, for the space. But I'll also say it's, it, it'll be high stakes, right? We're, we see uh, dozens, if not hundreds, of gene therapies in the pipeline, and so you know we're really poised to to revolutionize treatment of uh, rare and not so rare genetic conditions. Um, uh, but you know, at the same time. 
I just think back, I, I live in downtown Manhattan and I, I still practice medicine. I think about how, you know, we rushed uh, to bring therapies to treat COVID-19 and, and some of those drugs, uh, you know, we saw a glimmer of some clinical efficacy and, and ran with it and then had to backpedal. So I think we just need to continue to hold um, uh, genomics and gene therapies to the same level of clinical rigor and validity as we've held, as, as we've maintained over the past several decades. So a lot of excitement, but let's not let the hype uh, overshadow, um, you know, the clinical medicine. Yeah. And, and, and maybe specifically, you know, just touching on, on, you know, on gene therapy for a moment, you know, how do you, how do you kind of view gene therapy in terms of its integration with a precision medicine paradigm? Are, are you, you know, are you seeing that, you know, that gene therapy is kind of the next you know, the next wave of, of therapeutics and we need to figure out implementation systems or, you know, do you, do you have a different perspective on, on gene therapy? Well, you know, um, you know, it could be, you know, a game changer for a lot of these patients. Uh, I would, I would look at it as a yin and a yang, right? You need to have molecular diagnostics to die, to catch these patients early enough where gene therapy can be administered in the right by the right clinicians in the right space and, and really have those uh, impactful uh, outcomes. So if you, you know, as Dr. Walton men mentioned earlier, you look at spinal muscular atrophy, um, really, you know, uh, powerful treatment, Zolgensma, when diagnosed early before this neurologic condition. So it's about making sure precision medicine is, is widely available um, and, and making sure communities that are disadvantaged or vulnerable also have access to these great technologies. So you know, we can narrow gaps of care and, and improve the health of the patients and the communities we serve. Great, great. So uh, we're reaching the, the end of our time. Uh, and I wanted to just invite each of you to make any closing comments uh, that you want to make about uh, future state of precision medicine, uh, anything that is interesting for your organizations that, that you'd like to talk about um, before we uh, hand it back to Stephanie to wrap us up. Um, I'll start. Oh, go ahead. Go, go ahead. ahead. So, you know, I, I think the promise of precision medicine is uh, something that really can't be um, over uh, over considered. And so, you know, as as we start to look forward into the future, you, know, you can imagine a world where you go in and you get a, a, a simple blood test, but that blood test is actually measuring everything that could be going wrong within your body, and so. The way that I think about this is that, you know, all of our cells are driven by the underlying molecular machinery that's happening. And any disease that you talk about really is an aberration of that molecular system. And that's resulting in the uh, secretion and, and shedding of underlying pieces of our genome, whether it be the DNA component or the RNA component uh, that are uh, failing that have gone wrong in some ways, and the ability to tap into that um, in kind of a, a real-time scenario is going to allow us to identify, you know, not just cancer, not just you know genetic uh, aberrations from germline alterations, but really an understanding of of everything that's happening. And so um, that's a technology that is going to change the world in a in a dramatic way. It's going to change medicine in a dramatic way uh, because all of a sudden we're able to diagnose almost any disease that's out there in a relatively simple methodology uh, where we're not having to run lots and lots of different tests. You can kind of one run test uh, that gets them all. Um, and that's gonna change how we think about disease. It's gonna change how we uh, practice medicine and uh, it's really gonna you know, change the entire human condition. And so uh, I think that's why we're all spending so much time on precision medicine because you know, while we have some very near-term goals uh, in terms of you know making real strides in in oncology and in you know uh, pediatric uh, disease, um, the bigger picture uh, is something that we shouldn't lose sight of because it will truly change the human condition. Very well said, Nifa. Yeah. Dan. Yeah. Uh, sorry. Oh, oh, Dr. Walton, please. Okay. Sorry. <laughs> so no. Uh, um, I appreciate what was just said that I mean that that segues well into what I was was I was going to say is that there we are sort of on the verge of 
really um, this explosion of genomic data and what we can do with it. And I think that one of the biggest challenges and things we need to work on is that technology has, in my mind, it's always been so much farther ahead than where we are in healthcare. And it's the adoption of that technology and putting it into clinical practice that just lags and takes so long. And so as we increase the rate at which we can build and understand and put these technologies out there, we need to start working on our healthcare system and saying, and saying, how can we adopt these technologies faster? How can we put mechanisms in place to start to absorb and use these technologies? Because we're, even right now, technology is far outpaced what, what we're doing clinically. We have so much more uh, capability from a technological perspective. We just, it just hasn't been adopted clinically and, and just getting the healthcare system to absorb and use that from, from the provider to the payer is, is quite challenging and we need to have systems to do that faster. Yeah, and just to, to springboard off of that, I'll say uh, we will collectively know we are successful in precision medicine when we, when we no longer have uh, you know, panels talking about precision medicine because it will be just embedded in clinical practice. And you know, like many technology of the past gets embraced and just is, is embedded into, into clinical care. So, you know, we're excited for that future. We need to, you know, um, be thoughtful about how we get there and make sure that it's, there aren't any, uh, you know, missteps. And, and then also, I, you know, I mentioned earlier, but I think it's worth repeating just around making sure that precision medicine is not an, um, an aggravator of already alarming healthcare disparities, but really narrows those. So that's a big unanswered question. You know, we all uh, have to have to tackle. Completely agree, and uh, you know, I uh, I think we can all agree that um, the success of precision medicine is when all medicine is precise uh, and and equitable. And we're not we're not talking about precision medicine as a separate special way that that some physicians practice and when you know when we have disparities in you know access to care access to testing uh, and as you know David was was talking about earlier the fact that cancer patients 20 years later still don't get EGFR testing lung cancer patients when when we can when we can have a future in which all of you know, all patients have access to that, I think will be successful. And then uh, panels like this, we'll, we'll move on to the, the next area of innovation. Um, so I wanna thank uh, all the panelists uh, for, for participating and sharing their perspectives. I especially wanna thank the Med City News crew uh, for organizing such an amazing event. And of course, all the participants for taking time uh, in this uh, uh, slightly post pandemic or emerging from pandemic era uh, to, to be with us. And hopefully we can return to, uh, to seeing each other in person soon. And with that, I'm gonna turn it back over uh, to Stephanie to close us out. Thanks, Jonathan. Uh, and, and what a fascinating discussion. Uh, you don't, it doesn't get any greater than uh, changing the human condition. Um, so, I'd like to thank you, Jonathan, and the rest of our panelists for taking part in, in a fascinating conversation.